All right, this is a quick recording that covers the election of 1824. The election of 1824 is crucial in understanding American history, mostly because, like the election of 1800, it doesn't go according to plan. So the election of 1824 sees the final elimination of the Federalist Party. No Federalists run in the election of 1824. So essentially what you have are all the candidates running as Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans. We kind of dropped the Jeffersonian moniker at this point. So we have four candidates who are running for president, all under the same party. Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, William Crawford, and Henry Clay. Now, here's the key to understanding what happens. Andrew Jackson wins the most popular vote, which doesn't count for anything. Because in the United States, you have to win the Electoral College and not the popular vote. Andrew Jackson also wins in the Electoral College, but, and here's the problem, just like with the election of 1800, when some electors mistakenly cast their ballot for Aaron Burr instead of Thomas Jefferson, because he should have gotten 51%, no one gets a majority of the Electoral College votes. And that's what it says you need to win in the Constitution. You can't win with a plurality, which means you just get the most. You have to get to 51% of the total. That number in 1824 was 131 votes. Andrew Jackson, therefore, was short of the number that he needed, even though he got most of the ballots. Now, the other thing you notice is if you look at the map for the Electoral College, these votes are starting very much to break down along sectional lines. What I mean by that is that different geographic regions are beginning to support different candidates. This is exactly what the Founding Fathers wanted to avoid. And that's why they said that you needed a majority and not a plurality, because they didn't want a scenario where one portion of the country, because its population is higher, can simply dominate and tell all other parts of the country what it was going to do. Now, under the Constitution, because there is no clear winner in the Electoral College, it gets kicked to the House of Representatives. And so, oddly enough, our force plate finisher, who is the Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, finds himself in a very unique situation. Because as the Speaker of the House, he's the most powerful person in the House of Representatives and in a situation where he could guide someone to a victory. Now, importantly, he can't pick himself because the Constitution specifies that only the top two electoral college winners go to the House of Representatives for the final selection. And that means it comes down to John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, because they were the top two finishers, respectively. Henry Clay, though, is still in a position to be kingmaker. He is the most powerful person in his party who is in the House of Representatives. Now there, each state will cast one vote, with a majority of the votes being necessary in order to win the presidency. And this is where things get murky. After the fact, what's going to happen is Andrew Jackson, who is not going to win in the House of Representatives, is going to believe that there is a quote-unquote corrupt bargain struck between Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams. And that is because what's going to happen is Henry, Henry Clay chooses John Quincy Adams as the next president. Almost immediately after becoming president, then President John Quincy Adams names Henry Clay his Secretary of State. Many recent presidents have gone from the office of Secretary of State to the presidency. It's kind of seen as a stepping stone 
at this point. Now, there is evidence on both sides to suggest that this had nothing to do with politics or this was absolutely a quid pro quo. That is to say that it was a choice that Henry Clay made to select John Quincy Adams because Adams promised him this post. Can't say for certain. But really, a couple of important things come out of the election of 1824. Individuals recognize in the political process that having one party isn't viable. The two-party system begins in the Federalist era, but it really gets chiseled in stone after the election of 1824. Because after the, after the election of 1824, everyone recognizes that you cannot have a situation where you have more than two individuals running for the presidency, or it's unlikely that you're not going to get the majority of electoral votes. The other thing that happens is Andrew Jackson does not go away. Andrew Jackson absolutely sees this as a stolen election and is going to come back in 1828, face off against John Quincy Adams again, and this time running his own political party, the Jacksonian Democrats will win resoundingly. And the last offshoot of the election of 1800 is that it's pretty clear in 1824 that the United States is growing through a growing sectional crisis. That is, certain geographic regions of the United States are beginning to develop political identities focused around individual politicians and ultimately political parties. And these growing sectional divides are getting harder and harder to reconcile. And this is something that's going to continue right up through the Civil War.